Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this short game video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with Intel and a plethora of Intel 10nm Canon Lake, as well as a variety of Coffee Lake processors, which have been unreleased, yet the specifications have leaked to the internet, as they tend to do. Then we're going to move over to a piece of AMD news, specifically that the company are currently looking for a replacement for Raj Arkadori, but, according to source, is they are not looking to hire internally and promote to that position. Instead, they're looking to get someone from the outside. Then we'll move over to the Galaxy 9 because specifications have been released for that. And then finally, we'll finish off with the iPhone because the Chinese are not happy concerning the iPhone battery throttling incident. And instead of just, you know, kind of letting Apple off the hook, or just simply letting the customers vote with their wallet. The Chinese are launching an investigation. But, as I said, we'll start things out with Intel. So the i5-8500 has had its specifications leaked, thanks to a Sysoft Sandra database entry. And what we have here is a CPU which is most likely going to be a very compelling alternative to the current Ryzen 5 lineup. Obviously, we'll have to wait and see what Zen Plus brings. But when it comes to the i5-8500, six cores and six threads is what you're getting here with a clock speed, a base clock speed, just to clarify, of 3 GHz, which is a fairly pleasing clock speed. It's you know, much nicer to hear, let's say, 3 GHz rather than 2.9. Uh, and obviously, 256 kilobytes of level 2 cache per core, and finally 9 megabytes of level 3. If you're going to ask me what the turbos are, well, unfortunately, they have not been revealed on Sysoft Sandra, but looking at other processors in the lineup, it's most likely that it'll be the low 4 gigahertz mark, with at best about 4.2, or at lo lower end around 4.0. So it's, as I said to you just a few moments ago, it's looking to be a pretty impressive CPU. It's probably going to be around the Ryzen 16 1600X performance, as it scores 139.63 GOPS in the Arithmic test, or uh, 318, well, just a shade under MPix in the multimedia task, which is fairly impressive, to be honest, and once again should give AMD a good run for the money. For the other processors, we have the quad-core 8300 and the six-core 12-thread 8850H processor that, as you would expect, has nine megabytes of level three cache, but six times 256 kilobytes level two cache, and has a base clock speed of 2.59, which I'm assuming once again will get higher with turbo. There also is a ninth generation Canon Lake, which as you're probably aware is based on 10nm. And this sucker has two CPU cores, four CPU threads total, with a boost clock of 2.6 GHz, which might seem kind of anemic, but don't forget the fact that this is a Mobility Y series, so obviously low power solution, and a base clock of 2.2 GHz with level 3 cache of 4 MB. And it does indeed also have a better graphics chip in it. It has integrated UHD graphics gen at 10 and now on to the specifications of the Galaxy S9. I'd like to thank Paul, no, not myself, someone else, for sending me this story. So this is a clear packaging shot, and as you would imagine, it does give all of the details, assuming it's genuine, and it looks genuine to me, but obviously, you know, things could change, of the Galaxy S9. And it pretty much is, the best way of describing this is an incremental upgrade. So what we have here is, a 5.6 round corners inch quad HD SAMLED screen, a super speed dual pixel 12 MP camera, which has a super slow mo mode. And according to what some have already said of analysis of this camera, it's most likely going to be a variant of the same camera in the W2018 flip phone. And because of the speed of the aperture, it should be excellent for photography in low light conditions. Uh, there's also an 8 megapixel AF selfie camera, stereo speakers, uh, an IP68 water and dust resistant. It is a iris scanner, uh, a 64 gigabytes of memory, slash 4 gigabytes of RAM, wireless charging, and finally, 
Of course, earphones tuned by a KG. And don't forget that the mobile has been confirmed by Samsung to be launching in February, and that will be taking place in the Mobile World Congress. Unfortunately, we don't have details of availability or the pricing yet, so that most likely is going to be happening during the event. They'll probably reveal this information. And while I might be blabbering the point a little bit, it is essentially what I said at the beginning of this very segment. It's an iteration on the S8. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just not a complete and utter, like, you know, redesign with amazingly different specifications. So in other words, if you've got an S8, you, you know, obviously you might be kicking yourself if you've just bought one and then just saw this. But if you've had it, you know, since the beginning when you bought your phone, you're not going to think, oh my god, I'm completely and utterly obsolete now. Essentially, we're looking at better camera. Uh, that's probably the most impressive upgrade, to be honest. A slightly tweaked CPU and better speakers. And for a more a quality of life thing than anything, there's a tweak in the position of the fingerprint scanner. So that's obviously an improvement as well. Okay, so, just yesterday I confirmed our suspicions, and by suspicions I mean what Intel had already told us, that Raja Kadori had, of course, run away from AMD to go to Intel to craft discrete GPUs, or GPUs which, of course, would be for Intel's own specific usage cases, whether they're going to be for servers, whether they're going to be for mobile, whether they're going to be to nail to their wall to use as um, art decoration, we don't know. But regardless, what we do know is that there are going to be two variants that uh, Intel are going to be running with. That's a 12th and 13th generation uh, known as Arctic and Jupiter Sounds, respectively. So that's what's going on with Raja. However, as you can imagine, when someone leaves a company, especially with the position that Raja had, AMD need to now get someone to take over his job at RTG. So what apparently is going to happen, and I'm getting this information from fudzilla.com, so if this turns out to be wrong, blame them, pretty much. Um, AMD are planning to hire a non-AMD person within the company, and though and that individual will be taking over the engineering part of the Rajar's position. The business part is most likely going to be going over to Jim Anderson. Don't forget that he is currently serving as the Senior Vice President and General Manager of the Computing and Graphics Business Group at AMD, so his promotion to take over full you know, day-to-day -day operations of RTG makes sense, let's just be honest. According to what Fudzilla are telling us, AMD themselves, and we are referring to key candidates and personnel within AMD, were not happy with Raj Akadori leaving. That's not to say that they were wishing harm upon him or anything like that. Instead, they were sad for his departure because they felt he was critical for the role. Now, some people are cheering the fact that Rajar left, and others are sad that Rajar left. Some people blame him for Vega and believe that Vega was a tragedy. Others believe that Rajar, well, just didn't have anything to do with Vega, really, and by the time that he got there, pretty much he couldn't have done much. And others say that Vega was not a failure and it was a pretty damn good chip. Personally, I fall somewhere in the latter two camps. I think that Vega is not a bad chip at all. And I think the shrink down to 7nm is definitely going to really be invigorating for the chip. And I don't also blame Raja for it. The only thing I would slightly nudge as blame in Raja's direction is the fact that he did slightly overhype Vega. But then again that's kind of the job of someone who's in that position, right? And one can also this, say the same thing about, let's say, Jensen Huang. I mean, for example, when we saw the GTX 400 series launch back in the day, he, of course, was making a big deal of it. He didn't exactly... Oh, no one at NVIDIA, not just him, went on record and said, hey, look at the power consumption, look at the heat. Amazing. Because if you recall... The GTX 480 didn't even have all of its shaders released, and it wasn't until the 580 hit the door shelves that they managed to enable all of the shaders, so it basically ran at full clock speed, which was just simply because of peak, uh, heat, power, and uh, productivity issues. In other words, it was quite difficult to manufacture the sheer size of the silicon. As for hiring outside of AMD, that's not unusual. I mean, after all, engineers come and go. Look at the people who have gone to, let's say, Apple, or the people who have gone to Tesla, or the people who have gone to Intel, or whatever. Sometimes it's good to bring talent that had not 
grown up with the, how can I put it, the mantra of the company. In other words, you're bringing a fresh perspective inside the company. Obviously, sometimes that can bring some animosity as well, because veterans could think, I don't really like this new person there. You know, they're kind of grinding my gears. But on the other hand, from the point of view of bringing fresh perspective and from the point of view of not having, I don't want to say a vested interest, but you don't have this, um, I guess the best way of describing is this history of thinking and and this mentality of thinking in a certain way, you're essentially bringing fresh perspective. And anyone who's ever created anything at all, whether that is Photoshop art or written a, I don't know, dissertation or whatever, inevitably, the moment you send it to someone else, they're going to say, dude, didn't you realise you forgot to delete that little bit of background there on this Photoshop image? Or why, when you're spelling Albert Einstein's name on the second paragraph here, Have you suddenly referred to him as Hubert Einstein? And of course, I'm not saying that the creation of a GPU is anywhere near as simple as like correcting someone's name. I'm simply saying that sometimes it's good to bring a fresh perspective in to kind of change the direction of a company. Whether this uh, works or not is down to your imagination and quite frankly is down to us to peruse back on in like 10 years and say, hey... Look what happens to this company, and look what happened to that company. I don't think anyone could predict just the, quite how some of history has unfolded. I guess that's a good segue, actually, to move into iPhone. So, Apple are not exactly popular at the moment um, with many folks, but the Chinese government are looking to be taking steps to interfere with the issues concerning the older iPhones. Now, just to be clear here, when I say an investigation, they are asking Apple to formally respond. And they're not doing this in like, well, you know, when you get around to it, yeah, if you could possibly look into this issue and if you would be so kind as to respond within the next 30 days, then we can probably get the ball rolling and your guy can talk to my, you know, my guy and, you know, we can organise a secretary sorry, press secretary meeting, and then we could issue a joint statement. No, 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 no. Instead, what China are doing is essentially asking them, what are you going to be doing against, uh, sorry, to remedy this situation? Because they want not only an explanation for why they did this, in other words, put the slowdown in, more specifically, why it happened without uh, customers being informed and why it happened without customers being given the option to opt out but also what Apple were doing to rectify the issue. Now you're going to hold your hand up immediately start typing in the comments but you know you can get a new battery replace- replacement for $29 and this is true unfortunately that offer was not in all countries and it primarily affected America and UK and a few other regions, but did not impact China at all. Now, this is not the equivalent of being sued, necessarily. After all, it is only the beginning of an investigation. And while the Shanghai Consumer Council might not seem like a scary thing to begin with, after all, it is not an official government organisation, it is approved of by the Chinese authorities. So you can essentially say that it is acting almost with permission from the Chinese authorities, and obviously, you don't want to upset the Chinese authorities. We all know that there are also various class action lawsuits, although how those are going to go in the long run is as much as your guess is mine. But there is certainly going to be more investigations most likely launched towards Apple. And frankly, I kind of don't blame people from doing this. It's like, as I mentioned in my original video, so I don't want to once again just go over the point over and over again, but I I just don't like the way Apple handled this at all. Planned obsolescence is just flashing out in huge billboard-sized letters here. And just how Apple are going to respond, well, it's going to be an interesting next several months. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.